Good morning. It's great to be gathering together for worship this morning. Um, a huge welcome to everybody who's connected online already and those people who are still connecting online as I speak. Uh, firstly, I, I have not put any product in my hair today, so you are seeing the full volume that I've been living with for the last little while. But the good news is I've got a haircut booked in for tomorrow. And so um, enjoy it while um, you, well, I'm not quite sure if you are enjoying it. But anyway, uh, the good news is that, yeah, as things open up, uh, we'll be sharing and announcements, what that means for our church opening up. Uh, we'll get to that in announcements. But as we gather for worship this morning, um, I do have a few warm-up questions for you. Um, could you put those up, Jeff? Thanks. Um, I've, I'm missing one of my televisions at the moment, so I can't quite see everything. Uh, but my two questions are, since we are opening up, and from tomorrow, we can actually travel beyond our five limits, uh, 5K limits. Uh, what's a place that you would love to visit? We can't quite go out to the regional areas yet, uh, but we can uh, move a little bit more. So what's a place that you want to visit that you have not been able to visit for the last 11 weeks. So as you're saying hi to each other in the comment section, you might want to answer that. And the other exciting thing is that we can have some people over to our house. Not many yet, but still we can have some people. So we can have small dinner parties. And so um, just to, to uh, engage with each other, I'm just wondering what would be the perfect uh, food or dish for a small, no longer in lockdown uh, dinner party? What, what would you put together for a, um, yeah, some sort of a, a, ga a small gathering? What sort of dish? What sort of things would you serve? What would you like to eat if you went to one? So, so there's the two questions for today. Say hello to each other. Have a, have a chat in the comments section. And um, also, uh, you might like to answer those questions. I'm um, seeing answers come in. Uh, yes, visiting family who you have not been able to visit, Peter, I totally agree. Um, I've got a grand, no, uh, and what, what's it called when your nephew has a baby? Is that a something niece? A, I don't want to be a grand, but anyway, we'll work that out. Um, all right, so moving on, I also want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, the Daramurrigal people. Uh, the land that we are recording on, and acknowledge the traditional owners of the land uh, that you are uh, uh, that you are watching on. We pay respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging, and we walk gently on their land as we worship today. We've got a lot to to do today, uh, particularly 
uh, we've got a guest speaker, Dr. Sarika Gorridge, coming in. Well, not in the building. She said to record a video. Uh, she's the national director from Uniting World. And I spoke to her this week and she gave an update on Nimbong. Really looking forward to that later in the service. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Quibi, who's going to start our process of drawing close to God uh, through song. Uh, so thanks, Quibi. Good morning, everybody. With the restrictions now lifting, it feels to me as though I have got one foot still in lockdown, but the other one wanting to step out. And that, of course, made me think of our lockdown mumbo. Remember that one? The one foot remains in lockdown and the other one steps out. So it's like, you give me shelter, you give me peace, you give me comfort, healing and peace. You give me shelter, you give me peace, you give me comfort, healing, release. inside of us, often we just see broken, disjointed pieces, pieces of pain and pieces that doesn't make sense. Um, but God, our God, is in the wonderful business of redemption. Through his Holy Spirit, he works in us and he works in the world around us. And what he does, he starts to actually make things new and he makes things new beautiful and it may be that we don't see the picture yet but we can trust him to make us all beautiful all this pain i wonder if i'll ever find my way i wonder if my life could really change at all Oh 
If you had sound issues in that last song, uh, the tech team's all looking at each other going, we're not quite sure what's going on. Uh, hopefully that was just a one-off because we've got lots of videos to be showing today. We don't want those technical issues to continue, so we pray that they don't. Speaking of prayer, I'm going to lead us in prayer now. Let's pray. Of sustaining those who are struggling and liberating the oppressed. And we thank you that you have called each one of us to become part of the great task of transforming the church and society. So may we worship you now in the spirit of that vision that has led us thus far and will continue to lead us until the day where there will be no more pain, no more suffering, no more tear. When that friendlier tomorrow we love so well yet serve so poorly shall be drawn, shall dawn and smile upon our people. Lord God, grant that we may never tire of working with the oppressed for their liberation. Be with us today as we worship. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Thanks for all the great comments that is going on in the... Um, in the comment section, um, including the comment of what you call uh, the child of a nephew. Um, yeah, continue to, to engage with each other as we hand over to John for our kids' talk. Thanks, John. Hi, kids. You know how adults say these words and you don't really know what they're talking about? Sayings like this one. Um, that was just what the doctor ordered. I mean, what does that mean? That was just what the doctor ordered. Well, what it means is that was something happened that they needed or something that they really wanted to happen. But where did that come from? Well, you know when you're sick, you go to the doctors. Doc, I'm really sick. It hurts here and here and here and here and here and here. Help me. Great Scott! What is wrong with you? Well, Doc, I was hoping you could tell me. I'm going to listen to your chest and your heart. I'll look down your throat and in your ears. We'll, we'll do some tests. We'll get to the bottom of this. Okay. Take this to the pharmacy and see the pharmacist and he'll give you some medicine to make you better. You'll be right in no time at all. Hey, Mr. Mack, Doc gave me this prescription. He said this medicine will make me better. Can, can you give it to me? Hey, laddie, let me have a look. Hey, hey. Take a wee one of these pills once a day. They'll make you better. Thanks, Mr. Mac. In the Bible today, in church, we hear that when God created us, he wanted us to be happy and healthy, not unhappy or sick or for bad things to happen to us. But something did happen, and that something was sin, which goes way back to Adam and Eve, and that really changed everything for us. But God still loved us, and he had a plan to make us well again. A bit like when the doctor was going to give us some medicine to make us better. Anyway, when Jesus came to live on earth 2,000 years ago, he said he came to make us happy and whole, the way God intended for us to live. He came to heal the sick, 
and the blind and the lame and to free us from sin and make everything better. And if we want to have what Jesus came to give, we need to put our trust in him and live every day in the ways that he taught us, like we see in the Bible. Well, that's it from me. Have a great week and let's be thankful to God for sending Jesus. Thanks, John. Uh, for those kids who are at um, home and want to do the kids' activity sheet put out by the kids' church leaders, uh, all you've got to do is go to our website, uh, either to the front page, you'll see a link there, or to the page which talks about what's happening on today's services. Uh, the link's there as well. Download the kids' activity sheet and have fun with that. I had a quick look at it this morning. It does look good this week. So jump in there, see if you can do the origami. Army. Let's move on with some other announcements that we've got for our birthdays this week. Uh, Courtney, Steve, Ellen and Peter I've got for this week. Happy birthday to all of you. If I've missed your birthdays, please uh, put it in the comment section so people can wish you happy birthday as well. But the big announcement for today, which everybody's asking, is, well, what's happening for in-person worship? If things are opening up tomorrow in the state, what does that mean for us as a church? Uh, Well, there's three levels of opening up, uh, and the Uniting Church has strongly recommended that we wait till the second level before reopening. It's quite complicated reopening at the 70% mark, even though um, technically churches are allowed to. And so we're waiting for the 80% mark, which means that Sunday the 31st of October will be our first Sunday where we are opening all three services up for in-person worship. And aren't we looking forward to that? Um, It will be just fantastic. There will still be some restrictions um, for the month, uh, for that Sunday and for the month of November. Uh, You must wear a mask when you're coming to worship and there will be no singing in the building. The band can sing, but uh, we can't sing with them. And I know for some people they go, oh, when can we sing? Uh, The good news is that we can sing on the 1st of December. Uh, So uh, December, Advent and Christmas we will definitely be singing for. Well, definitely. Can you be definite about anything at the moment? We will be singing for. Um, So that's in terms of worship. Sunday the 31st of October uh, will be our first Sunday back. Uh, For those people who are watching online and wish to continue watching online, don't worry, we'll continue uh, the online format uh, in all three services as well. For uh, the groups that we have, no, this isn't working, Jeff, because I don't think I've plugged in the cord over there. (laughs) For for the the groups at the moment, um, yeah, for the children and youth groups, the Tara Turtles uh, and uh, the Friday night groups, uh, we are all back on a Zoom um, for the moment, but we are working out how we can actually connect in person. And so I know that the uh, Tara Turtles are exploring the idea of meeting in the park, and certainly for the Friday night groups, we've uh, tentatively put down Friday the 29th of October, once again in uh, stage two uh, of the reopening. We are hoping to open up the, the Friday night groups during that one. So Friday the 29th of October, there will be some restrictions that go along with that that we will explain to all our uh, families. But um, So that's the plan at the moment. Is this plugged in now, Jeff? Well, did you just go to the next one? Uh, so that's, could you go to the next one now? <laughs> and the other announcement that I have is that uh, Graham, our student minister, um, is coming up to the end of his time. I know it's been a weird student ministry for Graham because for most of that time we've been locked out and people haven't got to, to interact as much with Graham as we would have liked. But Graham, as one of his learning goals, uh, is putting together a presentation about... Uh, cosmology, science, theology, combining those things together. Uh, Graeme's got a, a, 
you know, a, a really in-depth science background and, and is bringing those two things together in a really interesting way. And so on this Wednesday, uh, we're going to put together a way that he can present that on Zoom, that presentation. Uh, it will be at uh, 8 o'clock and we will send out the details for that um, on our Facebook page today. Uh, we're hoping to do another one in a few weeks' time uh, for the young people, and, and if anybody misses out on the one on Wednesday, we'll tell you about that one as well. And I'll see if this one works now. Yes, it does. Once again, continue to encourage you to be praying for our Year 12s and their families, and we have definitely set the date for our Year 12 HSE picnic and prayer time together. It will be Saturday the 30th of October. Uh, we can have large groups in the park now, so that's very exciting. At 10.30am, we just have to decide on a park, and so we'll tell you all that next week. And lastly, the last announcement is just to do with the Thanksgiving offering. Uh, we will be closing that this week, so if you're uh, going, oh, I still wanted to do that, really today is, or tomorrow is your last chance of jumping in. Uh, but most of the goals have been met. Like, we can go past the goals if you want, and then we will just do more. Um, but, yeah, just, just an amazing, almost uh, $14,000 was uh, given during our Thanksgiving offering, which will make a massive difference and already is making a massive difference. Um, so we thank you for that. If you still wanted to participate, that web address is on the screen. I think that's all the announcements. So we're going to move on to our sharing time today, and there's going to be three different um, parts to this. The first part is that I actually interviewed uh, the National Director of Uniting World, Dr Sarika Gorridge, um, uh, during the week, and I videoed that so I could play it today. And that was really important because we as a church have been supporting a school in northeast India, right up near the Himalayas, uh, called Nimbong. We've been supporting them for uh, a long, long time. And I, I asked Sarika if she was able to give us an update of where the school is at, and so she was able to do that specifically for us. So I do thank her for that time, and we're going to watch that first. Then we will watch um, the Bible reading uh, for today. Angus will bring us our Bible reading and then following that, we will actually hear a sermon preached by Sarika that she pre-recorded, um, just reflecting upon what does it mean to do mission in a COVID um, environment and how we can still find, a little bit like we did at Thanksgiving Sunday, that God is at work um, even during these times. So, yeah, three different things to be experiencing. Uh, the interview with Sarika, the Bible reading, and Sarika's reflection on that. So I'll hand over to the tech team to lead us in that. It's wonderful to have you, Sareka, uh, to share with us later in the service. But for now, uh, just in this little time, we're really keen to get an um, update on Nimbog and, and how Uniting World is working in that area of uh, northeastern India. <laughs> um, so could you share with us, please? Of course. It's a pleasure. So, as you know, the, the little school in the village of Nimbong is... Um, They've, they've had an amazing year uh, because as you know, just like us, uh, COVID has impacted their community hugely and they've had to spend a lot of time with the school closed and the students at home. So a lot of the work over the last 12 months has been um, supporting the teachers to get all of their teaching online, to get videos of them giving lessons so they can then uh, use social media to um, share with their um, classes, getting um, notes printed and photocopied and delivered across the village to the kids. It's been huge, but I'm so impressed. Such a small community. Uh, that's a picture of the school. It's a wide angle picture um, and uh, without any students in it. This is uh, taken um, earlier this year when the students came back, they had to go to class master. They all had their temperature taken before they went into school. Uh, this is actually from last year. So last year, the person who came top of the public examinations was this young girl who got 84%. Um, I've taken all of these photos from Facebook, by the way. As you know, we haven't actually been to Nimbong for 18 months. We haven't been anywhere for 18 months. <laughs> um, the other good thing that they did last year was they organized vaccination for all of the kids in the school. So that's a little, you can't, you probably can't see it, but it's the Kalimpong District Vaccination Plan, which says Sumi School and Sumi was vaccinated on a particular day. So I just thought I'd quickly 
share that with you. So the background to the project is it's a little school in this village. It's a long way from any of the big towns and it was set up um, basically as a satellite school of the major school in Kalimpong uh, to stop the really high dropout rates from the kids who lived in these mountain villages because uh, it was so hard for them and so expensive for them to go to Kalimpong to study. Um, the school is currently at 169 students um, with 96 boys, 73 girls and 15 teachers. Um, they are hoping to increase their enrollment numbers by sort of between 30 and 40 in the coming 12 months if they can. Um, the objective of the, the supporting work that we do is twofold. So the first is actually to support the school's operating costs. So we cover off uh, a significant amount of the, the staff salaries as well as training for the staff to make sure that they have, the, uh, all of the staff are bachelor's degree qualified, but they need to have a master's in order to qualify for government subsidi subsidy towards their salaries. So we train them for that work. But the second objective is to actually build the capacity of the school as an institution itself to make their systems and processes robust, because our goal is that the school will ev eventually be, um, I guess, um, set up well enough to be registered and get government significant government subsidy towards the costs. Um, so it isn't necessarily a school, a, a church funded school or, or a donor funded school, but they'll have government support. So in this coming 12 months, um, out, the bulk of the funding is still around supporting the teachers and the, and the operating of the school uh, so that the kids can afford to go. But the uh, development of capacity this year will focus on three areas. One is around safeguarding and protection. So introducing child protection policies and, uh, into the school, which we did last year, but this year it will be comprehensive staff training, developing processes for how to handle incidents, how to handle complaints, all of that that the school needs. The other is, um, one of the issues they raised is the issue around gender equality. Uh, I mean, you'll see that the school is close to 50-50, but they're still on edge of the boys. And they are in a community where education for girls is still considered less of a priority than for boys. And the school really wants to encourage families to enroll their girls in school. So we're gonna be working with the school to run gender equality awareness work with the school, through the school with their local communities to encourage young girls to actually stay in school and get families to send their kids to school. And the third is actually around financial management and governance, setting up good systems and processes for the school to administer their funding. And one of the actually really exciting things is that because, we, because this is a diocesan school and we are, working with this school to raise their standards, the diocese has said, hang on a second, we can use this content and this um, project work to strengthen all of our diocesan schools because they have several other schools that they run in other places. So a lot of the work in developing good policy and good processes and providing training, we're not just training the 15 teachers and the staff at the school, we're inviting all of the diocesan uh, bodies from other places so that the program actually has a much wider reach than the little school. So with any luck, by the end of this year, uh, the Diocese of Eastern Himalayas, all of their um, school education groupings would have had significant um, upskilling and capacity in these areas. Um, so I guess that's kind of where, where, where we are at at the moment. So last year was surviving COVID <laughs> and just getting through. And this coming year is also surviving COVID and getting these kids into school and through their exams, but also beefing up their systems and processes. Um, yeah, I think um, that's probably a pretty good summary of where it is in a nutshell. <laughs> Oh, that, that's wonderfully encouraging. And mm. and we wanted to be encouraging you too. And uh, we just had a recent Thanksgiving Sunday where we, we thought about even in these difficult times, God is still um, being wonderfully generous with, with God's blessing right across the world. And as part of that, we did a Thanksgiving offering. And one of the options was to uh, bless those that we are supporting who is doing uh, mission work. Uh, which included the school in Nimbong. And I've made this beautiful little check, which I think is backwards on the screen. <laughs> no, 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 it's the right way around for me. Oh, on your <laughs> one. It might, might be on my one. Uh, a wonderful little check here to say that um, we raised $1,600 for the school, which is <laughs> above and beyond our normal giving. 
um, for Thanksgiving Sunday. So we will get that through to you, um, that money through to you so that you can pass that on and, and bless the school and the work that you're doing um, there. That is wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Phil. And thank, thanks all of you, Taramara Uniting. That is, that, is, that is a beautiful gift and we will make sure that that, so the work that we were hoping to do this year, you've just helped you know, get us that much closer to getting it done. So thank you so much, mm. uh, really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we'll, we'll love to, you know, we don't know when we can travel, but when we can, we'll hopefully we'll get you more photos and things like that. But it's been a dry year for, <laughs> for, <laughs> for real time use, but um, there you go. Good morning. The reading this morning is from the Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, and the power of the Holy Spirit was with him. The news about him spread throughout all that territory. He taught in the synagogues and was praised by everyone. Then Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath, he went as usual to the synagogue. He stood up to read the scriptures and was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it is written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and announced that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. Jesus rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. All the people in the synagogue had their eyes fixed upon him, as he said to them, this passage of scripture has come true today as you heard it being read. This is the word of our Lord. Good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me here today. And before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of this land, the Durramurrigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. So, last year, at the start of the pandemic, I emailed Reverend John Yor, who was the is the General Secretary of the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan. I was sending him electronic copies of posters on hand washing and isolating and other health messages, hoping he can share that with the church community. John wrote back to me, thanking me for the posters. And then he said, how can I tell them to wash their hands when they don't have clean water? How can I tell them to stay home when I know that if they don't go out to work, they will have no food. Even I don't own a fridge. I have no food unless I go to the market every day. But I will share your information. But I don't know whether it's going to help. But throughout the rest of 2020, John Yore and the staff of the Presbyterian Church of South Sudan worked tirelessly. They took soap and face masks and dry food packs to people in their homes and in the various refugee camps in South Sudan. They checked to see who needed help. They fought to get tank water delivered. Already crippled by intertribal conflict and widespread food shortage, drought, and a locust infestation, COVID-19 was almost the last straw for South Sudan. But yet, John and his team did not despair. He wrote to me again and he quoted Ecclesiastes. For everything there is a season, he said. I don't know when peace will come to South Sudan, but I love my people and I will be here when it comes. Around about the same time in India, millions of suddenly jobless migrant workers were walking across the vast countryside from lockdown cities to their home villages. They carried no food or money they only carried the virus with them. In Amritsar, near the Kashmiri border, near northwest, uh, in the northwest of India, COVID ripped through the population, making it one of the worst hotspots in India at the time. In Amritsar, Christians make up less than 1% of the population. 
They're mostly people from the Dalit or the untouchable caste, and they're singularly disadvantaged when it comes to education and health and social mobility. And nowadays they face increasing opposition as Hindu fundamentalism influences the secular state. But when I spoke to Om Prakash, or OP, one of the staff members of Amritsa, he told me about, that he had chosen not to join his wife and children in the relative COVID safety of the village, but had chosen to stay in the city so that he could take rice and lentils to the multitude of day laborers who were quietly starving in their homes during lockdown. The bishop, a man in his 60s, went along on these trips as well, on <laughs> driving the trucks. He was refusing to let his staff take risks that he didn't take himself. And OP told me of a Hindu woman who fell on her knees and asked for a blessing from the bishop, saying, we had no one to turn to, but in my heart I thought maybe the Christians will come. Today your God is my God. Bishop Bunu and his wife Lily actually caught COVID from going out on these trips, and they were gravely ill for a while, but they have recovered, and to this day they continue their relentless work amongst the people of Amritsar. In Bali, a tiny 12,000 strong Protestant church, they kicked off an initiative to grow and hand out seedlings of vegetable plants, desperate to keep the people that they had lifted out of poverty from starving or selling the precious possessions that they owned. They opened up their church facilities to act as isolation centers when the hospitals ran out of room. And across the Pacific Islands, church leaders fought misinformation and panic amongst their people, promoting health messaging and fighting the shadow pandemic of domestic violence. Because as jobs evaporated with the tourism in the Pacific, women and children copped the brunt of the frustration and anxiety in the home. God's people are an amazing force in the world. I bear witness to what God's church can do and what it can be like. In Christ, we rise above despair and devastation, like in South Sudan. In Christ, we go where no one else will go and risk our lives to show compassion to those forgotten by others, like in Amritsa. In Christ, we share what we have selflessly and we overcome the flaws and failings of our own human nature. So today, when we stood up to say the Lord's Prayer, we stepped into this heritage. Followers of Jesus have been saying that prayer for 2,000 years, in hundreds of languages, from cottages to cathedrals. So we are like a stream joining a river. We join the ranks of the citizens of God's kingdom, part of a 2,000 year history. And the power of this prayer is that it grounds us in our own identity. See, Jesus taught us, Jesus gave us this template of interacting with God, and it starts, our God in heaven, hallowed be your name. It starts with us recognizing ourselves as a child of God. And we say, our Father. But simultaneously, we say, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. So just in case the ridiculous audacity of claiming this intimate relationship escapes us, we emphasize the holy, set-apart, heavenly, truly awesome godness of God. Our Father who is in heaven, this tiny, outrageous juxtaposition of words that we say so easily, in it lies the whole hope of our souls. This is what Jesus came for and taught for and died for and rose again for, so that I and each one of you can know this truth, that we are a beloved child of God Almighty. China is the home of the fastest growing church in the world. About 400,000 people get baptized every day. Sorry, every year. <laughs> I was going to sound silly. And three new congregations are opened every day. 
But how does this happen in a country where public evangelism is illegal? Where the government takes down the crosses from church roofs if they stand up too high? The church has little or no role in social welfare and professional leadership is hard to come by. They barely have an ordained minister for every 14,000 Christians in China. The answer is simple. It's word of mouth and personal witness. When people discover Christ, they change how they live. They change how they treat others and their friends and their neighbors become curious. They ask them about it and they get pointed to Jesus. They get invited to meet other Christians and they come to faith. I wonder, what would it mean for you and I to be so profoundly changed by our identity as God's beloved child that our friends and our colleagues and our neighbors start coveting what we have and start asking us about it? Surely, our challenge must be to live such questionable lives. The relentless yet gentle gaze of Almighty God is on us. We are granted complete, unconditional acceptance. God meets us not with a rule book or a contract, but with adoption papers. And being gifted this status as a child, we are promised all that we need to live up to it. But how do we walk so close to Jesus that others can remark the change? How do we grow the fruit of the Spirit so obviously that people notice? And that our joy and our gratitude is so much that we can't but share the source of it with others. D.T. Niles once said that Christians are, should be like beggars who show another one where to find the bread. Because it doesn't end there. Because if our Father locks in our hope for ourselves, the very next sentence nails the hope for our world. Because we say, your kingdom come, your will be done. So right there, in the very next breath, we are committing to a world run by God's values and priorities right here on earth. The transformation that God offers doesn't end with ourselves. It extends to the whole world. So we come back to our reading, Jesus' mission statement in the synagogue. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight for the blind and to set the oppressed free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The love of God that Jesus offers is not just a self-improvement program or a ticket to heaven, but the lived experience of peace and justice and freedom right here on earth. Jesus is not just proclaiming that each one of us is a beloved child of God, but Jesus is proclaiming that all have the right to the riches and freedoms that God has gifted God's children. So if this was what Jesus came to do, then I suggest that this is the work that we are called to do. That we must work to restore the dignity and humanity of all around us that has been destroyed by the imbalance of power and wealth and injustice. We must break down the systems that entrench privilege, that trap generations of people in misery. Does this tell us how we, in a post-Christendom world, can live lives that turn heads for God? We live in a society where people think they know what Christians are. Self-righteous, judgmental, hypocritical, covering up child abuse, anti-women, anti-science, anti-gay. We can't bear witness to Christ by turning back the clock. We can't fight a rearguard action to try and keep Christianity's dominant place in society. We need to go where Jesus has always been, to the margins of society, 
to those who are forgotten, marginalized, and ignored. To share our faith is to make the love of God tangible to those who are on the, in the underbelly of society. So, when we go without luxuries to pay for each other's need, for other people's needs, when we take a low-paying job in order to serve society, when we vote for governments and policies that divert money from our own pockets towards the poor and the disadvantaged, that's when we own our identity. When we volunteer our time to serve our community, when we advocate for justice through letter writing and political engagement, when we direct our money in our purchasing, our investment and our charitable giving to support enterprises that create a more just society, then we bear witness to Christ. When we make love the very starting point of our being, when our prayers are soaked with care for others, when our first instinct and our last action is to bless others, then we live as a child of God. And I think our witness needs to embrace acts of repentance and truth-telling. We need to change the way we see ourselves. We must admit that in Australia our comfort and security has been bought at a price paid by others. We must admit that each one of us is a beneficiary of historic injustice that created the inequalities between ourselves and our first peoples and our global neighbours. That simply by living our ordinary lives, we continue to be complicit in the exploitation of people and the planet. But the wonder of the gospel is that it liberates both the oppressed and those entangled and complicit beneficiaries of the oppressive systems. We are both invited to be God's children, and our liberation is inextricably entwined. So God's call to action is as radical and dangerous and inflammatory as God's call to identity. Our discipleship calls us to authentic identity, not just in relation to God, but also in relation to all of our fellow human beings. And all over the world, as I hope you will see through the seven days of solidarity, we have powerful proof that God is faithful. That without power, without wealth, without institutions or slick leadership or clever programs, with only the faithful witness and service of ordinary people who remember their extraordinary identity. Through the sharing of personal stories from person to person, through life choices that so embody love that they draw attention, the Holy Spirit moves to call people to Christ. So, let us never forget who we truly are. Let us never forget the power of the one to whom we belong. Our story, our actions, our witness is the spark that God will use to fan the flame of faith in those around us. So let us go out and live a life that raises questions. Questions to which the answers Point to Jesus. Amen. Well, we do thank uh, Sarika for not only uh, sharing her time with us this morning, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that the National Director of Uniting World can take time out to speak with us, uh, but also for that message. Uh, she mentioned at the end there the seven days of solidarity. You may remember we did that as a church back in, I think it was. July, we, we had, a, had a go at seven days of solidarity. Uh, but if you'd like to see those stories that she mentioned, they're still on the Uniting World website. Uh, just Google Uniting World, you'll go straight to their website. 
and you can read those stories that she uh, was talking about there. So we do thank her for that and I'm going to now invite Ian to continue this sense of us being part of the mission of God uh, by leading us in prayer. Thanks, Ian. Oh, sorry, we have a song before we get to prayers. Thanks, Jeff, for reminding me. Let's do um, this special song that we have. I'll hand over to Quibi for the song, and then we'll hand over to Ian for the prayers. So our next song, again, is a Taramara Uniting Church homegrown song. I wrote the lyrics, and Steve wrote the melody, and he also did all the videos, um, the visuals of the video. It's based on 1 Corinthians 12 where God explains how each of us has got a superpower and if we can just embrace and love and do what we do as individuals best, eventually it becomes a whole beautiful orchestra playing God's music. So we really hope that you are blessed by this song and that you enjoy it. Singular letters, each of us together, however we're more. Word sentences, paragraphs, syntax and grammar, we're yours. A piece in a puzzle, an abstract shape, we fit it together with. God's design Your glory displayed When we're one In your potter's hands We surrender it all In your careful touch We trust Paint us, O oh God Link us together Pictures of praise, the mercies ablaze. In your potter's hands, we surrender it all. song on our own solo and small We're playing together crescendos arise your music of love your score stitch or a thread a color a knot messy and loose and too tight We're braided together in your design Coming your tapestry of love In your potter's hands to surrender it all In your careful touch we trust We trust us, O God, link us together Your pictures are praised Please, your mercies are placed in your body. 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when you sent your Son, you gave us a brother who sympathises with us. Though without sin, he was tempted in all the ways that we are. We thank you for this beautiful story which demonstrates your great power and wonderful compassion. May we never forget who you are, both in your majesty as our God and in your compassion as our brother. Father, as we face temptations, may we trust in you and not our own strength. May we rely on your spirit and your word and not our own wisdom and power. There are many in need of your healing and upon their lives. And we pray that more of us may recognize our brokenness and admit the need of your touch upon our lives. Thank you that Christ died to pay this terrible price for our sin and that through his blood we are healed and made whole and use us to share this good news with those with whom we come, to come in contact this week. Please grow our hearts to desire scriptures, sweetness and nourishment more than we do now, and help us to live our lives rooted in your word and for your glory. May we keep our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, in whose name we pray. Amen. Just before we get to our last song, um, can I just acknowledge how good was that song by Steve and Quibby? Um, I'm so disappointed the sound got mucked up in that, but we might try playing that song at the end and see if we have another go at getting it right through. Uh, but in, in the meantime, can we just acknowledge our offerings that we've been giving uh, and hold all of that up to God? Not only the offerings that people give uh, every week through their tithes and offerings, but also the Thanksgiving offering, as I acknowledged before. Uh, if you are wishing to support um, other things as well, uh, you've heard about the work of Uniting World today, and they uh, have got a big donate button on the front page of their website as well. And I'm sure that Sarika and her team would appreciate any support, not only the money that we gave them through the Thanksgiving offering uh, for Nimbong School, but the other projects as well. All right, well, we've got to the end of our service, so we're going to hand over to Quibby for one last song. Thank you, Quibby. Some things just really go well together. For example, a fork and a knife. Great partners. Or salt and, wait for it, pepper. The wonderful thing is God actually invites us. He says to us, we are his perfect partners to go into this world and make this world a better place, to bring heaven to earth. What a challenge and what a privilege.
Sorry, I was over at the sound desk. We're still trying to work out what's going on. Um, as we come to our benediction today, um, I hope that you've heard the challenge for Sarika that God is definitely at work right across the world. COVID-19 may have caused disruption and caused hurdles, but that has not stopped God's mission. And we are invited to be part of that and to continue to be God's hands and feet in this world. So may we do that this week. As New South Wales opens up a bit more, may we look for the opportunities to live out our faith, to show love and to make a difference to our communities around us. And as we do that, may the blessing of God be on us today and forever. Amen. Well, uh, no, they're not morning teas <laughs> this week. Sorry, I should take that slide off. Uh, there is a morning tea this week, but not those five different ones. You can go to the link on our Facebook page and follow that through to the morning tea this morning. Uh, we do, we'll try and play Stephen Quibby's song again for the outro. Uh, once again, uh, enjoy this hair that I've got because you won't see that again. Um, it's getting cut tomorrow. And uh, just a reminder that we come back for in-person worship on the 31st of October. I think that's all. Our night service has got a great service tonight. If you want to join them, 6.30 tonight, they have Karen Mitchell-Lambert from Pulse uh, coming and speaking. And we will be live in the building again. Um, night church has been pre-recorded for the last little while, but we are going back live in the building again. So that's 6.30 tonight. Otherwise, uh, let's see if we can get through Stephen Quibby's song again, and we'll see you all next week. Bye for now. Singular letters each of us together, however we're more Word sentences, paragraphs, syntax and grammar We're yours A piece in a puzzle, an abstract shape We fit it together, we're one The God's design Your glory displayed When we're one In your potter's hands We surrender it all In your careful touch We trust Paint us, O oh God Link us together Pictures of praise, the mercies ablaze. In your potter's hands, we surrender it all. Mm. 
Please. Your mercies are 